welcome to the programme. I'm Nima Abu Arte. Of all the Arab uprisings over the past couple of years, many people believed that Tunisia's revolution had the best chance of succeeding and building a vibrant new democracy. But the assassination of a leading opposition politician is threatening to throw the country back into chaos. So this week we're asking, what does this mean for an economy trying to get back on its feet? Also coming up this week, Following the money, we meet expats working in the Gulf and visit their families to see how wages sent back home are being spent. Ringing the changes, how can this region's telecom companies make bigger profits? The handset market is quite uh, lucrative as people do change their handsets based on fashion, based on functionality uh, and simply based on peer pressure. And a bitter pill to swallow medicine in the UAE is getting cheaper. So who's losing out? But first, it's just over two years since the revolution in Tunisia and last week's killing of the opposition politician Shukri Bin Aid has plunged the country into crisis once again. This week, thousands of people took to the streets of towns and cities around Tunisia, with many blaming the Islamist and Nahda party, which leads the coalition government, for the killing, an accusation that it strongly denies. The events led Tunisian President Monsif Mazouki's secular CPR party to say it would withdraw from the Islamist-led government, a decision that it reversed to give talks more of a chance. But one thing is clear, the future of this government is in the balance. Now, this uncertainty, of course, has hit the country hard, with a relatively small and well-educated workforce and established industries like tourism, Tunisia was seen as the hope for change that the Arab Spring would bring. Well, this week, our Middle East correspondent, Willa Davies, was in the capital, Tunis, and explained what this means for the country's economy. The scenes across Tunisia are very reminiscent of what we saw here two years ago, when the last authoritarian government was overthrown. There's political, social and economic upheaval. And watching all of this nervously from the sidelines are foreign companies and investors. French firms in particular, from car manufacturers to call centres, are based here in large numbers. And thus far, they've decided to remain in Tunisia. But tourism, of course, is the one sector that's really been hit by the Arab Spring revolutions and nowhere more so, perhaps, than in Tunisia itself. It employs about 400,000 people out of a population of 11 million. In the year following the revolution, that sector fell by about 40 to 50 percent. It did pick up again last year, but all of this trouble in the last week or so and this inclement weather will not help this year's crucial Easter spring market. The one thing that tourists, investors and businesses all crave is stability. And there's precious little of that right now in Tunisia. Now, while investors watch Tunisia carefully, might its loss be the Gulf's gain? Just this week, the UAE's Prime Minister said that foreign direct investment here in the UAE last year was over $8 billion. That's up from $7.7 billion in 2011 and a big leap from $5.5 billion the year before. Now, much of that growth came from capital being pulled out of the likes of Egypt and Tunisia and being put here where there's more stability. But is this hot money or here to stay? That's a question I put to Mohammed Ali Yassin, the head of Enbad Securities. It's difficult to know, but I think from what we see around us, the spring looks like it's more than just one season. Looks like it's going to be maybe for a few more years. And therefore, I believe there's more potential or more of this sticking within. With, but whether it's going to go into productive sectors of the economy or just stay in, for example, the real estate, those are the questions we have at the moment. The issue here is that if this money wants to go back, where will it go back? The place where it left is not a great place to invest again. So in the absence of alternatives, it is we, probably we should assume it's here to stay. So where is it coming from? Wealthy individuals, corporate money or governments? All of the above. What we've seen is people from... from Old governments in places like Egypt and Syria and Tunisia are, are here and there's some of their wealth, of course, is coming over here. But places like Iraq, places like Libya, all of those places are, we see people who had wealth. Old wealth which escaped and new wealth is being generated because of the new, uh, new, new findings on the ground. Those are actually finding their way into the UAE. Is it good for the UAE's economy, specifically Dubai's though, because it pushes property prices up and people who live and work here can't afford to continue living and working here? If it continues increasing at the levels we've seen in the past year, probably in a year time it will be difficult. So is history repeating itself? 
history is repeating itself, but not with the same people. And I think that is an important point, I think, here to remember. And that is why we get those cycles always. Is it happening at the same speed? I think not. And I see that there are some, although it is not announced, there are some steps that are being taken to try to make sure that we don't move too fast into a bubble. But doesn't this make Dubai more vulnerable when it comes to things like sanctions, whether it's the United States or whoever, saying this money is coming from well, we don't know really where it's coming from, necessarily. Probably the normal people like you and I, we wouldn't know. But at the level of the government, they know where this money is coming from. And it's at that level they need to control and to make sure. There are lots of scrutinies happening at the moment for certain monies coming from certain countries. And the banking sector is being very careful, and we've heard about rejecting certain nationalities' accounts at the moment. Like Sudanese and Syrians. And Iranians. And therefore, and Dubai in particular, you talk about the positive, some of the negatives is because of the sanctions on Iran. A lot of the trade has been lost. But because of the other areas probably booming, they have been able to compensate for some of that loss. But there is a contradiction. A bank is saying that if you have more than about $30,000 on deposit, you can still have an account, even if you are from these countries. True, because they, they take the excuse of servicing it, but I think definitely they want the high net worth. What that tells you is that banks want the high net worth individuals, they don't want the retail investing. So this makes the bubble grow bigger, faster. If, if this money goes into real estate, indeed, but I doubt it will go, because this money is not dumb money, this is clever money. And this clever money means that they need to find an alternative, a reasonable alternative. That's why I say, if it is not managed within certain boundaries, you may find places like Bahrain or some other places which we may welcome this and they may compete for that money in the future. Mohammed Ali Yassin from NBAD Security speaking to me earlier. Now, for some expats here in the Gulf, life is glamorous, glitzy and fun-packed. But for the majority, it's about work earning money to send back home to their families. Across the Gulf, an estimated $83 billion was sent in remittances last year, and partly to take advantage of the weak rupee, 30 billion of that total went to India. Now, around one and three quarter million Indians live in the UAE today, and in a special report this week, we meet two of them, find out about their lives here, and visit their families back home to see how their hard-earned wages are being spent. I'm Gyanendra Singh. I'm 39 years old and I have come to Dubai from Uttar Pradesh in India. I've been working as a bus driver at an Indian high school here for more than four years now. The salary is better than I would get in India. I earn $735 a month and send around half of it back home to my family. The amount left with me isn't very much and I spend it on rent, food and other expenses. I share a room with six people so that I can save on rent. We also cook and eat together. At home I have a wife and four daughters and the money I have sent there is spent on school fees, electricity, telephone and medical bills. But I have spent the most amount of money on building a house because then we have a place to stay. I have also bought some gold. I speak to my wife and daughters over the phone in mornings and evenings. I think of India all the time. My plan is to save as much as possible from my job here for my family. My name is Tribhuvan Narayan Singh. We receive money from my son Gyanendra once each month. Sometimes, if we need more, I call him and he transfers it to my bank account. Here, we use the money for a lot of things, like farm work, the kids' education, clothes and food. Jobs just aren't available here. So how can we survive without money? That is why my son had to leave the country to earn a living. He has four daughters and to get them married, it is important that we have money. So he has to save up to pay for their marriages. My name is Sarvapriya Singh and I am 15 years old. Although my father is in Dubai, we speak on the phone and every year he comes home during the summer holidays. I miss him a lot. I think if father was here, then he would have taken us out. If there was a magic show or if there was a fair, I think he would have taken us. It would be nice if he was here. My name is Deepak Kaul. 
I am from Delhi, India and from last 6 to 7 years I am living in Dubai. I am 31 years old and I came to Dubai to earn money and to give better growth to my family as well as my myself also. Especially for iPhone or iPad. India is very, very tough and uh, we have to work more what what we are working in Dubai. In Dubai it is little easy. I am a wife, her name is Rashmi. Recently I have a baby daughter, her name is Parthi. So we are happily living together here and I love them very much. So I send money to my father. We have make a house, very nice house. It is almost two, two stories house. After that my marriage was there. We spent huge money on my marriage. After that my brother was in doing engineering. We have spent money on him. My name is Basanath Kohl. Deepak got a chance to go to Dubai after his MBA and I was very happy that my child could go abroad. He has helped me a lot when I was in need of money. I was a teacher in Jaipur. After my children finished their education, I came to Delhi and built my own house here. And Deepak has helped us. He's been gone two years and I'm missing him. My wife misses him too, even though he visits India once or twice a year. Yes, there is a big difference between the salaries here and there, but I want him to come back now. I am old and I feel that it would be good if at least one of my children was here with me. My name is Mohini Kaul. My son Deepak earns more money in Dubai so that he can look after not just his own family, but also us, his parents. I have memories. But what can we do about that? Someone has to make a sacrifice. Right, we're going to take a short break now. And when we come back, talking tablets are falling pill prices, just what the doctor ordered. Welcome back to the program. I'm Nima Abuarte. Mobile phones are hugely popular here in the Gulf. In some countries, there are two for every person. But markets aren't always competitive. In Saudi Arabia, for example, there are several providers to choose from. But here in the UAE, there are just two state-run firms that control the mobile networks, broadband and landlines. But technology is changing fast, and it's forcing companies and governments to rethink their strategies. Now, Ghassan Hasbani was the CEO at Saudi Telecom, and he's now an independent and consulted and I asked him how he would describe the Middle Eastern consumer in 2013. They love to be on the internet. Uh, predominantly also mobile internet is becoming the, the, the main access to, to the internet in the Middle East, a trend that we have seen in Asia and it's now being repeated in the Middle East. As more people have uh, more smartphones in their hands and have more access to mobile internet, we're seeing access to the internet increase exponentially in the region. This is a region where uh, social interaction is very important and social networks have brought this social interaction to almost everyone's uh, reach. Uh, therefore, this is a, a great commercial uh, opportunity as well as a great social change opportunity as we have been seeing in the last couple of years. But even in terms of things like handsets, I mean I read uh, recently that in Kuwait uh, people change their handsets every few months in fact. In some countries it could be as quickly as three months, in others could be a year, uh, but yes the handset market is quite uh, lucrative as people do change their handsets based on fashion, based on functionality uh, and simply based on peer pressure. Now, where is there money to be made for telecoms companies though? Because competing on the cost of a call, is that where you should be looking to make money? Or competing with social media platforms, for example? The cost of the call is going to zero out very soon. 
in this industry. A few, few more years and a phone call, a voice call uh, is, is no longer going to be relevant. The telecoms industry in this part of the world is looking to start competing significantly on new applications, on broadband connectivity, and they're catching up very quickly with, with more developed markets. In fact, in some cases, they are ahead of European markets. 4G is already in the region, is already commercially viable and operational. So this is where the competition is going to move towards. But do the operators in the region really accept and understand this or do they understand this and they're reluctant to do it because look Skype is illegal in many countries in this region voice over IP the same this is a combination of operators and regulators and policy makers decisions uh, combined and I think very soon the region will move towards a, a new model for regulations and managing markets. What are you saying to the policymakers of the region? What is it that needs to happen? I would say to them that they would definitely serve their national growth and economic agenda by being more open to foreign investment, local investment and private sector. By putting more trust in the private sector and letting go of public ownership of key commanding heights of their economies. Telecoms is one of them. But the telco companies have been seen as cash cows by many owners. How do you get beyond that point where it's just being used to print money but you're losing out on all the other business that you could get if you opened up the market? No, absolutely. It's, it's printing money from one pot but losing 10 other pots uh, now and in the future. And this is where governments are predominantly stuck today by being afraid of losing the immediate cash into treasury coming from the telecom sector, an industry that can bring billions of dollars in investments in infrastructure, productive infrastructure that helps the economic growth of the various regional countries. And without this, we will always have this problem of finding the 5 to 10 million jobs or the 100 million jobs that we need to find in the region for the youth of the region to make sure that an Arab Spring remains an Arab Spring and doesn't turn into a winter. Telecoms expert Rassan Hasbani speaking to me earlier. Now let's see what other business stories are making headlines across the region this week. Our man has approved plans to raise the country's minimum wage by 60% to around $850 a month. The country's lawmaking Shura Council also backed curbs on the employment of foreigners, which will reduce the expatriate population from 40% to about 30%. Low wages and unemployment have been a source of discontent among some Armenis for the past couple of years. Meanwhile, Dubai's ruler has called on private companies to employ more local Emiratis. Although quotas exist for some sectors such as banking, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum asked businesses to hire more locals as a contribution to the country's development. Emiratis only make up about 11% of the UAE's population and the majority are employed by government bodies. Private sector employers have long argued that they can't compete with salaries and working hours offered by the public sector and say that that makes recruiting Emiratis a struggle. Dubai International Airport's new A380 concourse has fully opened. With 20 gates capable of handling the double-decker Airbus Super Jumbo, it's the world's first purpose-built facility for the aircraft. Dubai's Emirates is the largest operator of A380s in the world, with 31 planes and another 59 on order. Now, here in the UAE, thousands of types of medication are going to be made cheaper after the government said that costs must fall by up to 40%. Now, this will bring prices in line with other Middle Eastern countries. Now, of course, people who have to pay for their own medication are the biggest winners, but who is going to foot the bill? Jonathan Fruin has this report. In total, more than 6,500 medicines will have their prices cut, following a government review which compared markets across the Gulf. UAE prices were the most expensive in the region, and for parents like Mariam, whose son's asthma medication is now expected to cost 25% less, it's an unexpected bonus. My son was basically born prematurely, which is why he's, um, he's got frequent asthma attacks. He's got weak lungs, so any time that he's around dust or anybody else with a cold, he catches it very frequently. Uh, we've been told to take asthmatic medicines almost on a precautionary basis, so we end up spending almost about $500 a month on um, these medicines alone. And I'm not counting all the other anti-allergy medicines that, that sort of support it. So I mean, I'm, I'm definitely very, very excited about this cut because it saves quite a bit of money. And I mean, in the long term, it's almost about $1,000 a year saving, which I'm sure we can use when you go on a vacation or something. I mean, I'm 
excited about that. This is the least of the medicines which their price has been decreased. The price of medicines in the country is approved and controlled by the government at each stage, from manufacturer to sales agent to what they ultimately cost the consumer on the pharmacy shelf. The time it takes medicines to get approved here is fast compared to most parts of the region. And the Ministry of Health says that manufacturers have been taking advantage of that to set high prices that were then undercut when marketing in other Middle Eastern countries. It doesn't take more than five months to be registered, while it takes maybe years at some other countries. And therefore, those companies are so keen to register their products with us. And the first time of registration, usually the prices will be much more higher than it will be registered two years later because there, will, there won't be any source of references to those uh, uh, products from the region. This is the production line for the UAE's biggest generic drugs manufacturer. Now you might think that a company like this would be a bit frustrated to get a knock on the door from the government saying you're going to have to reduce your prices. That doesn't seem to be the case though. Drug companies, whichever company, they make good profit. They keep enough cushions for promotion, for marketing and all these things. So this is direct from the government it came and they are very happy to do business in this part of the world. I am not at all unhappy, I am very happy with the initiative they have taken. Now that might seem surprisingly accepting of a policy that is in effect slashing a company's profits without much notice. And it seems not all drug manufacturers were as willing to reassess their prices, at least to begin with. Although the reflection maybe at the beginning was a little bit uh, uh, not positive uh, reflection and response, but um, by the second and the third meeting, until we reached to the seventh meeting with them, really we found that some of the companies, believe it or not, I have the documents from them, they, I requested them to reduce their price 40%, they gave me 50%. The new rules also offer an increased profit margin to private pharmacies that sell medication to the public. But the owner of a chain of stores I spoke with was worried that if prices fall substantially, he would still be making less money than before. Lower prices might, of course, mean increased sales, enough to make up some of the shortfall. And while some drugs will have their price tags slashed almost in half, many of the reductions will be far less drastic, perhaps just a few percent. Ultimately, manufacturers did not have much choice, and they've agreed to reduce prices with limited resistance, partly to maintain good government relations, and partly because they acknowledge the profits they could make here were out of kilter with elsewhere in the Middle East. Either way, for patients like Rahel and his family, it's a saving that will quickly stack up. Jonathan Fluen reporting there. Well, our time is very nearly up. I do hope you've enjoyed our programme. Before we go, let's see how the region's main markets performed. And remember, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is middleeastbiz at bbc.co.uk. And you can go to Twitter and Facebook for latest photos and news from our teams across the world. Now, next week, we're looking at the problem of fake fashion. Dubai's glitzy malls and designer shops have made it a tourist destination, but it's also a centre for counterfeit goods. So what's being done to crack down on it? Until then, from me, Nima Abuarte and the rest of the team, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.